uh, here's um, here's one of the objections that uh, Rabbi Singer raises. Because Levin's talking about. Okay, there's not. Okay, what we're doing is we are not going to take some amorphic texts and then apply them to texts that are graphic. What we do is we take texts that are in. This is the most basic principle. We take texts that are in the light that are clear, and we we then understand ambiguous texts, not the other way. That's how cults start by going the wrong direction. So what we do is we look at the Bible and we ask ourselves the question. We look at Isaiah chapter 11, which, which, which Dr. Craig Evans brought up, and he's right, it is talking about the Messiah. But what does Isaiah chapter 11 tell us about? Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 tells us it's from the shoot of Jesse, but verse 2, how does it end? It's talking about the Messiah. Everyone agrees. That's critical here. We don't disagree it's talking about Mashiach. You know how it ends? It ends with saying, and he will fear the Lord. Fear the Lord? You're just telling me that the Lord fears himself? Does God fear anything? And now, now, there's the, actually we do two objections, I just realized. He's going to fear the Lord. Yeah. If you're the God man, you are not going to fear the Lord? You're going to be an atheist? You're, you're, going to, you're going to break God's law? See, once again, the exact assumption is being made that the Muslim makes. And in fact, in many ways, I, I've, I've said this for years in, in discussing uh, Islamic apologetics, uh, Islam is a is a U-turn. Uh, Islam refuses to go as far and to accept the the further revelation that God made of Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So it makes a U-turn and goes back to the position that the Jews had, who refused likewise to allow that revelation on the part of the Triune God of Himself, incarnation, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They both reject the exact same thing, so they're going to argue the exact same way, and that's what they do. The Bible is made up of two main sections. One is called the Old Testament, the other is called the New Testament. What Christians call the Old Testament is basically the Jewish set of scriptures. You might say the Jewish Bible. The Jews refer to as Tanakh which is an acronym made up of, of three, uh, the initials of three words, uh, Torah, uh, Ketuvim, and Nabiin. The, 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 the Torah, the books, and the, and the prophets. Ba based on the initials of those three words, they have coined a new term, Tanakh, to refer to the set of scriptures. That is the set of scriptures that include the Torah, that include the books, and include the prophets, meaning the prophetical writings. Uh, Christians refer to it as the Old Testament. Why? Because they, they feel that with Isa alayhi salam, God made a new agreement, a new ahad, a new covenant. Uh, he gave them a new set of laws or, or instructions as a result of which if they follow, God is going to give them something in, in return. So there's a new Testament. That, that's what the word testament means in this, in this context. So God gave them a new testament through Jesus Christ, they say. So all of the scriptures that were written before Isa alayhi salam, all of the books, they're referring to as the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament is basically the Jewish scriptures then. And now, do you know from any of your Jewish friends that God is one in three or three in one? Do you hear any Jews saying God is Father, Son, Holy Ghost? No. So for centuries, the Jews have been reading their Bible, and all they're getting from their Bible is that there is only one God. And in fact, nobody else gets anything else from the uh, Jewish Bible but this teaching, that there is only one God. It's repeated so many times. It's uh, emphasized in so many different ways. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It's emphasizing one God. And that has become the most important teaching in, in, the, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish Bible. And it's stressed with such uh, emphasis that the Jews are required, according to the Bible, to write this statement that becomes now their kalima, their shahada. It, 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 they're to write it and take that written material and, and tie it on their foreheads and tie it on their wrists and, and nail it to their doorposts so that they should never forget that, that is the most central teaching. That is their kalima. That is their shahada. There is only one God. Now, that, that's, that's what Christians have inherited. 
because they've taken over the Old Testament. They made that a part of their Bible. That's their sacred scripture. So what else? Now, new teachers came on the scene. After Isa, a.s., there are people who started to exaggerate his position, starting to say that he is a son of God, and then take it literally, oh, really, son of God, son of God, yeah, so, you know, like his father. So God, father, now you have God the son. And then the, the idea of the Holy Spirit was a little bit confusing. It still is a little bit confusing for Christians because it, it, it remains a little bit unclear. When you speak of Spirit of God, are you speaking about another entity uh, other than God or are you speaking about God's own power? Sometimes it looks like you're speaking about God's own power. So it might be said in the Old Testament that the Spirit of God came upon a certain man and then this man became suddenly powerful. He did some mighty deed. So that spirit of God, do you mean the power of God or you mean something else like uh, one of the angels, for example, that is called spirit of God? This is a little bit unclear in the Bible, but it didn't matter to the Jews. The Jews were very clear there is only one God. And, and this fuzziness about the spirit of God did not really make a difference to their theology. Christians, however, now in that milieu in which people are worshipping many gods, you know, the Greeks had many gods. And in that Greek environment, once uh, the message of Isa alayhi salam came to be preached by his disciples, uh, this is where you find that people uh, are, are bringing their Greek ideas in and mixing it in with uh, the Jewish ideas that were found in the Old Testament and so on. In, in, in the New Testament, th this is now the collection of books uh, in the Christian Bible, which deal with Isa alayhi salam and his followers. So in the, in the New Testament, there is one book, of the 27 books that make up the New Testament, one book called the Acts of the Apostles. In Acts of the Apostles, we read that when Barnabas, one of the early Christians, and Paul, another early Christian, went to a certain uh, land to preach, the people there took them to be gods. And they brought their animals and, and wanted to sacrifice their animals to them. And they said, this is Zeus and Hermes, Greek gods. So they protested, they said, no, people, don't do this. We are not gods, we are only men. But, but this passage of the New Testament says that even then, they could not prevent the people from sacrificing the animals. Even though they were saying, look, we're not gods, don't do this. The people still sacrificed their animals, thinking this is Zeus and Hermes. So that's the environment in which the message now is being preached. So naturally, for anyone to say that Jesus is important or special, they, they started to give him the special titles. This is not an ordinary man, this is the Son of God. And now, when, when the original Christians preached that Isa uh, salam is the Son of God, uh, they must have meant that metaphorically. Like you say that somebody is a good man, somebody is special to God, and so on. You might say Son of God in that way. In the Old Testament, it was done like this. So in the Old Testament, in the Jewish Bible, even though Jews are strict monotheists, they have only one God, everyone else are the creatures of God. So uh, Dawud, Sulaiman, they're all creatures of God. Now, that's very clear in the Jewish mind. Yet, in the Old Testament, you will find that Dawud is called the Son of God, Sulaiman is called the Son of God, Yaqub is called the Son of God, and so on. Uh, so it did not matter to them this is metaphorical, metaphorical it means that God loves this person this person is special to God and so on but still human being so if the Christians started to say that about Isa alayhi salam, they were not in a way deviating from their historical uh, legacy it was still within the scope of their belief there is only one God Jesus is the prophet messenger of God and you can call him son of God meaning that God loves this person. Hmm? is close to God. But now, when this message is preached to the Greeks, who take Zeus and Hermes and so on for God, what do you think they're going to think? Ah, the son of God? Literally the son of God. So, when, when the Greeks started to come into Christianity, they started to embrace the, the, the way, as it was called at the time, uh, then naturally they came with those ideas and they made Isa a.s. literally the son of God. Now, Paul... Uh, one of the writers that I, I mentioned earlier as one of the early Christians, he became one of the most influential uh, teachers in early Christianity. And some of his writings, which are collected now in the New Testament, promote Isa alayhi salam to a high position. Uh, not only as the son of God, but the first creature of God. And not only the first creature of God, but also uh, the agent through which God created everything else. This is a Greek idea, that God didn't create things directly, but he created through an agent. And now Paul... Uh, represented Isa as that agent. 
All of the four Gospels are written after Paul. So Paul became an influ- influential teacher. The original disciples of Isa, a.s., their teaching did not uh, find much scope later on because they insisted on the following of the law. You must be circumcised. You must observe Sabbath. You have to distinguish between kosher and non-kosher foods and so on. So if, if they preached to Jewish audiences, uh, Jewish audiences understood their message and appreciated their message, some of them at least, uh, and, and they got some followers. But to spread the message far and wide, you, you, and you had such laws to, which for the Greek people and Romans would be difficult laws, you, you could not make much uh, inroads into the, the Greek and Roman society. But the teachings of Paul made inroads because he was preaching a message that was palatable to the Greeks and the Romans, saying you don't have to circumcise your children, you don't have to observe anything like Sabbath, and kosher and non-kosher food, who cares? You just eat whatever is sold in the market. So, I mean, that's precisely what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, and so on. Uh, so the, the message was easy for them to understand and easy for them to follow. He, they, they, he gained followers. Christianity then eventually became, as you know, Roman Christianity, only to be separated later on between Roman Christianity, Roman Catholicism, and uh, Protestantism in the 16th uh, century. But for many years, you had uh, Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism and uh, a, a, another uh, branch, the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church. So in, in, in short, now, in dealing with Christians, how do we explain to them uh, that what they have adopted here, th- this confusing statement that God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that, that, that this is not correct? Well, the way to explain to them is to show them exactly this history. And now you know the history. In a nutshell, what do you want to say to them? You want to say to them that you have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. If God is one in three or three in one, that should be the continuous teaching throughout. You know, you can have a situation where God gives one law for one situation and another law for a different situation, right? The two laws may appear different because the situations are different. But the the God himself cannot be different. It must be the same God throughout, from beginning to end. So if God was one in three or three in one, then we should know that from the start. The Jews should know that of all people, because they've been reading their scriptures for thousands of years. And uh, their scriptures should say that, but nowhere in the scriptures is that stated. It always says that there is only one God. That is the statement that they had to write on their foreheads and band on their hands and nail to their doorposts. How did it become like this that they said that God is one in three or three in one? It's because they started to accept Isa as the son of God and literally the son of God when the message was preached to the Romans and Greeks and they were already accustomed to having many gods. So naturally they thought of Isa as being uh, God, God himself. So having adopted the two, on the one hand, they have to insist that God is only one. And on the other hand, they want to accept that Isa is literally God. So now it looks like they have two, and now they have to explain how the two can still be one. And there is some confusion about the Holy Spirit. Now they just added the Holy Spirit to make it three. So now you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit as three, and yet they insist he must be one. But there's no way that you can have something that is three and, and yet one of the same thing. You can have three parts of something, uh, they make up a whole, we all know that. Like you can have like a three-layered cake, like you can have a cake, a little bit of icing, another cake, a little bit of icing, another cake, but the three, so there are three cakes, and yet there is only one cake, there's a bigger cake if you put a whole lot of icing covering the whole thing, right? You cut it, you'll see that there are three cakes in, it, in, in it, inside. But uh, let's say you have a, a vanilla layer, a chocolate layer, and a strawberry layer. Right? You can't say the whole cake is strawberry. Mm? The, the, only one of the layers is strawberry, right? You can't take the strawberry layer and say this is the whole big cake. There's only one third of the whole big cake, right? So th- there is no way in which you can have uh, something th- that, that is three and yet one of the same thing. You can have three parts that make up a bigger whole, uh, but, but you can't have what our friends are telling us that we should have. One God that is three at the same time. Uh, so we should ask them then, do you mean that when the three come together that makes a bigger God? In which case there is a fourth entity here. 
right? The fourth entity is the bigger one that's made up of the three smaller ones. And, and, and so ask them about the logic of this. And sometimes show, show them graphically. So you said the Father is God, right? Okay, that's the Father. You said the Son is God, that's the Son. Okay, you said the Holy Ghost is God. Isn't that three? He says, no, there's only one. Okay, well, you put the three together. Isn't that uh, a bigger God? Uh, Sheikh Didak used to say that, uh, you know, in, in the Bible it is mentioned that when Isa alayhi salam was baptized, uh, they, a, a, they, a dove came and alighted on his shoulder. And the Christians say, well, that's the Holy Spirit coming in the form of a bird and alighting on the shoulder of Isa alayhi salam. And then a voice called out from heaven, this is my son, listen to him. Okay, so now they're saying, the Christians are saying, this is our Bible, and this is what it says. It shows that the Father is in heaven, the Holy Ghost comes down, and the light's on the Son, and the Son is here on the banks of the River Jordan. Okay? So, uh, Sheikh Jidat says, okay, so you can picture the Son. There is a man. He's on the, uh, on the bank of the river. You can picture the bird. The bird comes and the light's on his shoulder. Okay, you can picture the Father in heaven. Maybe they think of the Father as being an old man with a long beard or whatever. He's sitting somewhere in heaven. Okay, so you have these three images on your, in your mind. Okay, so what's the image of the Trinity? So you have these three distinct images. These are the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in between. So what's the image of the three together? The one God that is in these three persons. There is no image for that one God. So you, you cannot picture that one. So there's a deficiency in the way in which God is being conceived of here. And obviously the solution to this confusion is to go back to what the Old Testament taught and to insist that there is only one God. Well, it's the Quran that brought us back to that message. And when people might say to us, well, you, you, your, your prophet is a false prophet. So we should say, okay, so this is what false prophets do? False prophets call us back to the original message that was preached by all of the previous prophets, like you know, Noah and, and Abraham and Musa alayhi salam. Uh, th that's what false prophets do? Is this the work of shaitan or is this the work of God that's bringing us to back to that original message? In fact, we should look back and see uh, what, what spirit... Uh, uh, cause people to deviate from that original message which the Bible had said they should write on their foreheads and band on their hands and nail on their doorposts. So th I, I believe this is a very uh, important point that we need to share uh, with uh, our Christian friends.